My name is Jan. I'm the senior microscopist and image analyst here at Monash Microimaging. I'm coming to you today from the land of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people from the Kulin Nation, and I will take this opportunity to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we stand today. It is a great honour to, for me to introduce Dr. Loïc Royer today. Loïc, like me, comes from France, and that's pretty much where the comparison ends, as I cannot claim such a prestigious CV. He initially studied engineering and obtained a master's degree in artificial intelligence, specialising in cognitive robot robotics in France. He then moved to Dresden to do a PhD in bioinformatics and then joined my the Myers lab, first in the Genelia Research Campus in Virginia and then at the Max Planck Institute. His works there focused, um, pun intended, on developing technologies at the intersection of microscopy and computer science. For example, Loïc developed the first adaptive um, multi-view light sheet microscope in collaboration with Philip Keller. Loïc is now a group leader at the Chen Zuckerberg Biohub in uh, San Francisco, and he and his team design innovative image processing and analysis algorithm, but also light sheet systems to help solve the mysteries of developmental biology. Loïc has been incredibly successful, publishing regularly in the top tier journals like Science, Nature um, and Cell. And more importantly, uh, his work has had a great impact on the field as reflected by over 6,000 citations. His lab seems to have developed a solution to most of the challenges we face when we try to image uh, large living samples. And they very generously make this very um, uh, freely available to all. And today in his talk titled, The Future of Bioimaging from Advanced Light Sheet Microscopes, Self-Supervised AI to Large Language Models and Beyond, Loic would present some of the most recent tools developed by his lab. Please join me in welcoming Loic to the Monash Advanced Microscopy um, webinars. Loic, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. To uh, to talk to uh, to all of you uh, about the work from my team, um, uh, one quote I really like from Sine Brenner is the following: "Progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas." Probably in that order. And I think that's a very nice quote because it really uh, inspired me at the beginning when uh, six years ago when I started my lab, and that really. Um, Many of these the ideas contained in this quote were 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 uh, key to, uh, to 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 the to the work that we've done in the team, and one of one of the key ideas in this quote is that everything starts with new techniques, and that and that the order here is important. It really starts with the techniques, and and the methods uh, to see to measure and, and access reality. Um, and so when I started the lab six years ago, I decided to do something a bit crazy to start a lab which will come, bring, to, bring together uh, advanced microscopy, image processing and analysis, and, and use all these technologies to answer questions in developmental, developmental biology. Um, and uh, the reason I wanted to do it this way is because um, I think there's a beautiful interplay between these three disciplines and they really feed on each other and having a team that would have, you know, uh, um, um, people that would uh, excel in these three disciplines together in the same team would be key to uh, to advance these disciplines individually, but also achieve something in synergy that would be more than the, the sum of the parts. So we basically start, you know, from the beginning, started uh, uh, developing techniques and methods. And uh, since we chose, uh, I chose the, the zebrafish as a, as a model organism for my team, um, one of the first challenges we had was to how to raise the fish, you know, in a very compact fashion in the system, that, you know, in a very compact fish facility, uh, using you know full automation. Um, and once we had the fish, then the next step was to build latchet microscopes. Uh, we built you know a basic latchet microscope, a multi-view, uh, as I had you know worked with uh, a similar instrument to to what I uh, had worked with in Janilia with Philip Keller. Um, but then we pushed further the limits of, of, of that, you know, with single objective latchet microscopy, and I will talk to you guys about this. Um, another problem that uh, I faced early on is that I decided to switch from Java to Python as the my language of choice and uh, for, for programming, you know, image processing, image analysis algorithms. Um, and I realized there was nothing really good to look at the images. And so uh, on the weekend, I started a project called Napari, 
which has since then you know uh, uh, grown dramatically and now there's a beautiful uh, very vibrant community uh, developing it um, and uh, once you have you know uh, uh, the fish once you have the microscope you start acquiring large amounts of data you need to process that um, and and, uh, and so we you know we, we developed uh, for our own purpose, some 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 packages. We you know also contributed to other projects uh, of the same kind, um, and uh, all the way to um, you know uh, really trying to track cells and whole embryos over long periods of time at scale, uh, which is something that we just recently uh, are releasing now, and uh, and um, and we are very excited to to show you some results of that today. Uh, another thing that's so really something ever, ever, ever since we worked on care with uh, with the team from Dresden, uh, uh, um, I've been passionate, you know, I've, I've been very interested by uh, image noising. And one of one of the things we did recently was to to make a package that makes it very easy, a self-contained app that makes it very easy for people to denoise images using very fast and very uh, very safe algorithms for image denoising. And finally. Um, also, in collaboration with uh, with Manuel Lonetti at the Biohub, we worked on very cool on a very cool project to to featureize uh, uh, images of cells in a self supervised fashion, which led to some very nice uh, uh, work also published in Science. Um, but I mean, all these techniques are really just a means to an end, from my perspective. Uh, and let me just close the door because it's a bit on the other side. So yeah, I was saying that it's all a means to an end. And um, really, you know, all this work to, that we put, you know, in, in terms of developing the infrastructure, the methods that we that we needed, was really the was really towards the end of of uh, mapping development at scale uh, over multiple modalities. So Merlin Langley, my my team was leading this project called Zebra Hub, which we uh, uh, printed uh, earlier this year. Uh, that comes with also with a website uh, that uh, lets you know everybody uh, access the data required. And the the really the idea of Zebra Hub was to map uh, zebrafish embryonic development both using imaging and using two uh, two different kinds of instruments, but also uh, we uh, delve deep, deep into a, a, a single cell uh, a sequencing. And so we we produced a, a time resolved data set of single cell. Uh, 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 RNA sequencing data at the single embryo level. So we have a single embryo resolution. It's a, it's a very large project. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a talk on its own right. I will not talk about this today, but just to give you a sense of you know, why uh, um, all these techniques have, have been developed is there was really an intent behind that. And, uh, and then there was really a, um, a dream uh, to get to this, and then, and we we are still working towards uh, towards bettering this this resource uh, that we are sharing to to uh, to all scientists out there. So, uh, the first step for us really is to see, uh, which means that we have to use uh, uh, microscopes, and our, of course our microscopes of cho uh, of choice are light sheet microscopes. And their main feature is that they're fast, they're gentle, and they're volumetric. So we get, we you know, uh, we acquire this by eliminating uh, 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 the sample um, with a thin sheet of light and, and imaging that, that illuminated plane and only that illuminated plane, we can achieve uh, volumetric images at very fast rates uh, and in a way that is very gentle to the sample. So we typically don't have uh, photo bleaching or, or, or photo damage. Um, uh, so we can image for, for hours and potentially days. Uh, living samples that are, in our case, uh, zebrafish embryos that are developing uh, within the microscope. And typically, the, 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 the samples are alive at the end of the, I mean, <laughs> that, that we, we do not keep uh, imaging set, the data for imaging sessions where the, the embryos are not alive after the imaging. Um, well, that's very important. And, you know, back in 2016, you know, I had worked on this uh, adaptive multi-view latent microscope which was special because it could align itself. And that was that's a fantastic machine and uh, we have built it in the lab. Uh, this is uh, our uh, California SimView uh, with an uh, autopilot, but also with a photo manipulation arm that lets us you know, photo convert flow for us, which is uh, something we used a lot in our Zebra project. Uh, this is a great machine, um, but um, the sample mounting is a little tedious. 
uh, you see we, you have to mount the sample in a, in a, in the FEP tube uh, within agaros and it's it's a bit of an art and uh, it's a, it's a challenging process um, and certainly you cannot mount multiple samples uh, or if you try you know you typically have a lot of badly mounted samples whereas you really want to actually just image one and image it well so uh, at that point you know it's clear we needed better microscopes and uh, uh, and so we we set we we set ourselves to build something new, and this was really the project of Bin Yang and my team uh, uh, back uh, back back in the in, in 2019 and 2020 when we were working on this, and we designed this microscope called Dashi, which uh, has the property that it can image very large samples with very fine resolution. Um, let me explain a little bit more. Uh, in a typical multi-view latin microscope, you have multiple uh, objectives surrounding the sample, but that's very impractical, both for sample mounting, but uh, also in terms of you know uh, accessibility to the sample. So it's complicated. So another another approach, which has been uh, popular, you know, popularized by by uh, by uh, several people in the field, uh, is to uh, send an oblique light sheet through your sample, and you can do that from a single objective. Um, and so you know, there's been you know a lot of papers on that where you can you know, uh, do cellular imaging, but also embryo scale imaging. And it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic you know, subfamily of latch microscopes that have been very quite successful in recent years. Um, and when you look closely at what's happening, you have your oblique light sheet, you scan your, you scan your, um, your, your sample through it. And uh, the reason why we can do this oblique uh, uh, in, uh, light sheet uh, illumination is because we have a special objective uh, that, uh, Allows you to uh, um, uh, image the virtual uh, the virtual uh, virtual image of the sample, and 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 because of that you can actually you know uh, um, uh, image the, the image the the illuminated plane at a, at an angle, and this a special objective has a special you know a, a wedge to be able to do that, and what's really remarkable is that actually the resolution of this microscope is. Is 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 quite high because the NA is one point zero, um, and, and that is one of the advantages of having only one objective surrounding the sample in proximity to the sample is that you can actually, you know, essentially collect uh, more light and and there's less that constraint of of multiple objectives that kind of typically reduce the choices of objects that you can use, right? And uh, this 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 special objective was designed by. Uh, 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 Andy York at, at Calico and Alfred Militzikin. Uh, and it's a very special objective. It has a working distance of zero, a nominal uh, field of view of 450 microns, um, and an NA, uh, as I said, of 1.0, which is, uh, you know, um, you know the, the NA of, um, of the, the multi-view Latin microscope we have in the lab is, is 0 0.8. So quite an improvement in resolution. Um, so, and the kind of things you can do with this microscope, because you actually are mounting the sample now on a standard, you know, a dish or, or, or plate, you can actually, and, and the scanning is done by moving the sample through the, through the light sheet, we can scan, actually scan very large fields of view. Uh, this is almost six millimeters of, of scanning along X. Um, and so that's, that's uh, very unique. So we can scan entire uh, zebra fish larvae with this instrument. Um, and in the case of embryos, we can still do very fast imaging. Um, there's a lot of tricks involved in this microscope. I cannot talk about everything, but uh, we, we, we can uh, do, the, we can do a, a zebrafish embryonic uh, development imaging at, at very fast rates. Here's uh, essentially half a minute per time point. And we get very exquisite images, which are uh, the favorite images of, uh, of uh, of uh, Jodal Brangantini, who is the, the person that does all the track, the cell tracking for us in the team. Um, and um, yeah, clearly that instrument is his favorite. Uh, the resolution is exquisite. We can really resolve this, the nuclei of the cells very clearly. Um, and you can see here, I don't know how much that goes through through uh, um, so Zoom, and I, I, uh, you know, I recommend you check the paper and the, and the videos in the paper, but um, the, the 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 resolution is 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 quite fine and quite uh, uh, quite good for tracking. So here is again the same video I showed before. Uh, it's it's quite you know remarkable the the resolution that we access here and especially in the field of view. 
and in combination, you know, I can, you know, when I process the images, even a 4K monitor is not enough <laughs> uh, to actually see every pixel on the screen, uh, which is uh, which is kind of uh, something I was not expecting uh, to happen anytime soon. But um, uh, once you have acquired these images, you know, you don't want to just, you know, have these images on, on your hard drive. You need to turn them into information, into insights, and, and, and try to, to make sense of what's in there and, and, and try to make discoveries, uh, make hypotheses. Uh, and so, so you really have to start processing these images. In our case, what we're interested in is mapping uh, embry embryonic development. So what we want to do is um, follow each and every cell in the developing embryo. That's very challenging. Uh, and that's why we have to develop both the instruments and the algorithms in-house within the same team. Uh, here, uh, Joe Dao um, uh, basically developed this algorithm called Ultrac, uh, which is uh, um, you know, a very good uh, uh, algorithm for cell tracking. Uh, it's actually you know, um, performing very well on the cell, tra cell tracking challenge. And uh, you can see here, uh, uh, first, the cell segmentations obtained from, from the data. Um, we rewind the video, uh, and then we can look at the tracks. And this is essentially a visualization of all the tracks of all the cells. Um, and Ex excuse me, look, we have yes. a problem with the video. It keeps going back to your Sydney Brenner quote. Um, oh, I think really? it happens a certain amount of time after you've changed the slide. So even if you kept moving your mouse, maybe okay, that would let, help. Let me, we can't see let the video. Let me just restart. Uh, the... Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Just tell me if there's anything wrong, because like I really have no way of knowing. So here, so is it fine now? Yes, that looks good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So here you see one, you see one, um, one cell uh, that's been tracked, um, and eventually it will reach a cell division, which will happen now. Exactly. So and cell division is a very nice little explosive process of the cells. If I pretty fast, uh, uh, typically in these in these movies, um, and if we if we go if we zoom into and this is another you know another cell it's not the same as we just saw if we if really zoom into a very dense tissue, uh, we can follow one cell uh, uh, we can we can see the neighborhood of that cell in both x y and zx. Here, of course, you know, lecture microscopy is what uh, you know as, as any any optical microscopy we have the typical you know. Uh, lower resolution along the z axis but that does not impede uh you know, ultra from doing a very good job at following that single cell um and it's not just a single cell as i showed you before that we are following we're following all of them and if we if we follow again uh, another cell um and, and and look at a different view of the context uh this video should be playing yeah then we will eventually uh, reach a subdivision, which is which is a difficult uh, process to um, to go across when you when you think about tracking because it's a it's a difficult process. But if the imaging is fast enough, and that's again where you you need to push also the 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 instruments uh, to their limits, then we can actually find the subdivisions, uh, follow the two daughter cells. And follow their 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 destiny, <laughs> their fate eventually. So now we're following the two other cells of that. The cell. And, and you have to imagine that this is, you know, within a context of you know hundreds of thousands of, of cells um, that are surrounding the, or that that's just single single cell that then divides into. So, and we can you know so Jordan has ways to 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 analyze that and follow all sorts of cells and 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 their histories and so on and so forth. And I really just recommend, you know, you check all track uh, uh, the, the, the tool that he developed. Uh, that's a repo. And then, um, you know, uh, he will, uh, at the I2Key confer online conference, he will provide, he will give a two hour demonstration and tutorial on all track. And so if you're interested in how to use this tool, uh, check, the, check the repo, but also check, check the tutorial at, at I2Key. I2Key is information to, Images to knowledge uh, conference, right? So um, another cool thing we can do with this is once we have the tracking data, we have essentially a, a virtual embryo, right? So we can do virtual experiments where we mark certain cells and then follow them uh, in silico. 
so we can do experiments that we would otherwise have to do by either dye injection or uh, uh, photoconversion. We can do uh, experiments and try to understand with something that's not easy to comprehend uh, for our brains is the the whole all the patterns of, of fates that cells have over time during a developing embryo. It's a very complex task to you know when we look at these videos, it's difficult to comprehend what what part of the early embryo contributes to which parts of the late embryo. That's that's very difficult. But by doing virtual experiments, it's a way of querying the data that's very effective. Uh, and if you do that, then you know the case. You know what we could use that in our Zebra Hub paper to really um, you know go after very concrete questions about the fate of certain groups of cells, uh, um, uh, um, depending on when we do the photoconversion or the you know the uh, simulated photoconversion, uh, and uh, and then essentially gather insights uh, on, on the on the on the biology. Uh, it's a very powerful approach to uh, to take you know the cell tracking data. And gather gather knowledge on it. So, yeah. And the thing is, like with imaging, um, you know, we 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 we're never in a position where the data is perfect, right? And where it's immediately usable. And and of course, you know, uh, one of the things that you know uh, you can do with your data is to try to denoise it. Um, uh, if you have a lot of noise in your images, you, you want to do that. And this is something that, you know, it's a project we started, you know, during the pandemic. Um, Iden, which is a, a, an app, a self-contained app, it's also, you know, you can also pip install it. Um, you can also um, install it on your machine and you can use it to denoise images and it's very user-friendly. Uh, it's really designed to, to be, uh, you know, standalone, user-friendly. It has lots of different algorithms because there are different Quality, the different trade-offs, uh, different algorithms have different trade-offs in terms of speed, quality, use of uh, um, ease of config uh, of parameterization, uh, or uh, safety in terms of artifacts and hallucinations. So lots of so there's not really a silver bullet. You know, I, I truly believe that the different imaging uh, conditions and problems require different algorithms for denoising your images. So, so here with this uh, rather you know complex interface and, and self-explanatory, lots of the documentation is in the interface. And what's interesting is actually uh, Ahmed Chancellor, who designed this, uh, made it such that the whole UI is actually autom automatically generated from the documentation within the program itself. So uh, that means that if I add things to it uh, and parameters, or if I add algorithms, then uh, you know uh, I just need to make sure that the the kind of uh, doc strings of the Python code are are set. And then the interface is automatic, automatically generated for this, uh, which is a cool, a cool feature. And then, so you run the algorithm, you have lots of things to parameterize, you know, and on the website, we have a lot of tutorials on, on different data sets. And here's an example data set where, uh, from actually from, uh, from our Zebra Hub paper, where, you know, we have this, uh, you know, we have this, uh, in this case, these are confocal images, uh, because we did some, uh, some in situ, and we can basically, you know, use that to, to denoise, uh, uh, denoise our uh, uh, HCR um, uh, uh, images to be able to, uh, you know, to to gather insights from that. So, so that's one cool example. But but there's some pretty striking striking ones. Like for example, for two photon cation imaging, um, we can get some pretty, pretty spectacular results. And what's very interesting is that. Um, most of uh, uh, most of the algorithms we implement are extremely optimized, and and and, and they're, they're typically much faster than than your typical denoising algorithm that you can get. Uh, here, for example, you know it takes you know less than two minutes to get from a, from that data set to a denoised uh, uh, stack. Um, and what's also interesting about Iden is that it's, it's uh, there's a lot of auto tuning and cell supervision. So. Um, we have, of course, you know, uh, the noise to self, uh, slice noise to void approaches in there. Um, but uh, we also use the noise to self theory, which is more general than just neural networks. And we can actually um, automatically tune any denoising algorithm. And that's why we have a long list of, of classic, but also more modern algorithms that are all auto tuned. And that's very important because it turns out that if you take that sometimes the classic denoising algorithms, uh, work better than the fancier ones if, if they are tuned to perfection. And I didn't can actually find the perfect parameters for these for these algorithms. And in some cases, it's advantageous because 
uh, and, uh, um, um, Excuse me, Loic, it's, uh, it's happening again. Now we're seeing oh, the okay. silico fate mapping. Okay, so now, okay. This, Thank this, you. Yeah, uh, stop, stop me as soon as it happens so that you know, we don't waste, you know, like the, the we don't lose some information in the process. Um, so, yeah, so I was saying that basically, you know, Iden has uh, all the algorithms that are implemented in Iden is are auto tuned, and so they 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 are very um, and, and that's good because if some of these classic algorithms are guaranteed not to hallucinate anything, right? Some of the classic denoising algorithms uh, do not hallucinate, um, and if you can tune them perfectly, uh, the results are extremely safe and sometimes extremely uh, compelling. So here is an example of. Uh, a, a kind of noise to self approach, but not using uh, not using neural networks, but using uh, other techniques, um, and we still can denoise images in a in a very spectacular fashion. Um, and there's basically no risk of hallucination here. Um, here's another example. These are images from uh, uh, from Jean Jean Leon Maitre in Paris. Um, very nice, you know, work they've done on uh, on uh, human embryos uh, uh, imaging, and here you can see. You know, the raw image on the left, on the middle, you have, you know, what's a classic denoiser, which is classic, classic Butterworth, which is pretty, um, which is a pretty, uh, it's classic, it's very, very simple, you know, low pass filter algorithm, but it's perfectly tuned. And then uh, the more sophisticated noise to self approach that does not use um, AI, but uh, or deep learning, but uses ML, machine learning, uh, and that per performs also extremely well um, and, uh, and also, also extremely fast. Uh, here's a, here's an extreme example where there's literally no almost nothing that you can see on the raw image on the red, raw data, and then through um, uh, uh, through the application of I, then we in you know, within within six minutes or so uh, with a laptop with a GPU you can you can get uh, images that reveal a lot of information. And um, from our this is a data from our collaborator uh, Laurent Cognier in Bordeaux. And uh, you know what we see there is actually real from 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 our from our work with them. Um, here, uh, Sheng Zhao and my team uh, has worked on some you know uh, uh, you know uh, expansion microscopy work here, and then we see that even for expansion microscopy, uh, Iden is is uh, is capable of denoising the images. And what's interesting here is the noise is not. Is not in the camera. Um, it's actually molecular noise. It's actually noise that comes from the from the staining process. And um, I then uh, and the different algorithms I then perform extremely well on, on data uh, such as these. So um, that's great. But you know, in the past year, you know, there's been a bit of revolution, and that's the rise of large foundational models. Of course, everybody has heard about this, right? Uh, one of the first things that happened. Was the release of uh, by, by Meta AI of the uh, segment anything uh, um, algorithm and, and model, uh, and Jordan Bergantini, my team, quickly in one day made a, a Napari plugin for this uh, for this uh, for this work. There's been since then other plugins that have been developed, um, and and so um, this segment anything model from Meta AI is very interesting because it's a, it's, a, it's a deep learning model that's able to segment. Uh, anything in a 2d image right and it turns out that anything you know for 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 in the in the paper uh, of meta anything means any 2d images that you would find in in, in photographs of the of the real world in our case we're interested of course in biological images um and uh, it's remarkable that it also works on on, uh, on on 2d images of of cell nuclei for example here um and so uh, another, you know, uh, very famous example of a foundational model, uh, in this case, a large language model, is uh, ChatGPT, and you've all been playing with it, I'm sure. Um, you know, we can think of it as a little, uh, as a baby Skynet, perhaps. Um, very powerful. Um, uh, some people are a little scared by it, but um, in any case, it's uh, it's definitely something that is become, um, um, you know, a game changer, uh, and so. Earlier this year, um, you know, uh, I've wrote for Nature Methods a, a small piece that, um, you know, tries to to dream a little bit about what the future of bioimages, uh, the bioimaging could could hold for for us. And I think the 
what what came from came, what came out of, of this for me is really this idea that um, these large foundational models and in particular la uh, large multimodal foundational models will probably change change how we think about our interaction with with data um, and um, and and I think it will become a dialogue between mind and machine and and the way to think about it is really that now machines can not, not only process uh, text and and we've seen with ChatGPT they're incredibly incredibly competent at you know dialoguing and 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 holding knowledge uh, and um, and conversing with humans and ha and holding very very uh, uh, insightful and and accurate conversations. Sometimes there's of course mistakes, but uh, they they perform. Uh, uh, I mean humans also make mistakes. Uh, humans also sometimes you know uh, you know say things that they they, they don't really know. Um, and, and here the idea is uh, maybe in the future, what will happen is that we'll have a large multimodal foundational models that will be capable of ingesting not only text, but also images, data sets, all sorts of data and be able to make sense of it and, and have a dialogue with the user or perhaps, you know, the, the user will say, you know, here's an image, uh, there are some nuclei on the image. Please, uh, please uh, segment the image, and then the the, the 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 model will the agent will reply with with a proposal, and maybe the user will refine this through a dialogue. And and so you can imagine, you know, a whole a whole new paradigm of how image processing and image analysis will be conducted. And I think it's not just for bioimaging. I think it's like this this idea generalizes to the whole the entirety of science, right? It could this could be done with in any discipline. Where we have data that we need to analyze, and where we might need to communicate our intent to the machine in a way that is uh, not via code anymore, but via a dialogue with a with an almost sentient uh, machine. So it's very exciting, um, and I thought this was really like a dream, very very far dream that that we would not be able to approach uh, anytime soon. But um, you know, as I wrote this piece first, I realized wait a second, the technology is almost there. So almost uh, you know a month or so later, um, you know uh, I, uh, I I think it was more than a month actually, but uh, more like two months perhaps. But um, I, I realized that there was a lot of technology out there we could. That, you know, first, there's ChatGPT of course, but there was APIs for ChatGPT from Python, and there were also libraries like LangChain uh, that would that, that made it very easy to compose different components with it for for uh, that, that leverage. GPT and other and other technologies. And so I set about to build this, this agent, this intelligent agent called Omega, that's ChatGPT based, Napari where, so essentially it's able to operate with Napari and load images and so on. And it can converse with you and do image processing and analysis. Actually, it can do almost anything you want it to, to do. Anything that ChatGPT can do, it can do. If it can write for code for it, it will do it for you. Um, so here, here are some videos. Um, I loaded a um, you know three channel image, one of the standard uh, example images in in Napari, and I just control right now the Napari viewer with text. So I just explain what I want. Uh, I want to rotate an image. I want to zoom an image. You know, and this is all done by text. Um, and um, through um, some rather intricate machinery, this is all uh, um, and, and a lot of um, prompt engineering. This is basically generating code. That, that gets execu executed within the you know Napari context and and operates on the on the Napari viewer here, for example. Um, and you know you can remove layers in Napari. You can you know do anything that you you know essentially anything that's doable via code can be done. And as long as you can express it in a way that is not ambiguous, you can actually manage to to ask uh, Omega to do it for you. Um, and here's another example. Uh, where we segment the cell nuclei present in the selected layer. Uh, it writes the code for it. Um, in this case, it uses Stardust. Um, some, some, uh, some of these classic and very uh, popular segmentation algorithms are kind of built in into Omega to make it easier for, it, for Omega to use these tools. And here, so here, not only it can segment nuclei, but it also can count. It find, can write code that counts the number of nuclei in the image, and then. Uh, you can even ask for it to write a CSV file that lists all the segmented nuclei together with the area and the coordinates. And then, and then even ask it to open it 
uh, on your on your machine. Um, I don't I don't really have to teach any any of these things to to Omega because ChatGPT knows how to write code for these things if you can explain it in a clear enough fashion. Which you know uh, when I was doing that, frankly I was blown away. Um, I just couldn't believe that that it could work. It doesn't work every time, right? I mean, it's, you know, ChatGPT is not perfect, makes mistakes. Um, so sometimes you have to, you know, argue a little bit with the thing. But um, uh, and there's also an issue with the latest version versions of ChatGPT four in particular that somehow have, you know, been lobotomized uh, and they are much worse than they used to be. So some things used to work much better in the past than now. That's creating a lot of uh, headaches for me, but uh, and for others, frankly, but. Um, Pretty cool overall. Uh, here's another example where we segment the nuclei on the selected 2D image again, uh, but this time um, we'll do something different with it. Uh, what we will do is make a widget that takes the labels layer and returns a new labels layer but filtered, only labels within a provided uh, range of areas, min area, max area, are kept in this new layer. Right. So that's what you asked. So you asked. Omega to create a widget that will be added to to uh, to um, to Napari, and that widget then can actually do what uh, you know we asked it to do, which is to filter you know to filter uh, labels based on area. Um, and sometimes the widgets are not doing exactly what you want, but then you can argue with the thing, and then you get the new widget that 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 actually does does what you want. So you know it's it, you know it's. Uh, uh, or it'll very useful, and I, you know, I, I, I have quite a few ideas on how to extend that to actually make it so that you know more more people can use that uh, in an effective way. So um, I'm going to the end now. I think this is one of the last examples. Make a widget that draws a scale bar, and this is what probably my, my favorite one. In white on the lower right corner of a 2D monochrome image, parameters should be length of the bar and pixel resolution in microns. This 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 is a widget generation task that only works in ChatGPT four. Uh, ChatGPT three point five doesn't work very well, but in four, the first time I tried when I got access to four, I tried this and it worked super well, and I was just blown away. Um, here, it does a slight mistake. It doesn't get the, it, the the scale bar is dark because this is a you know great grayscale image, and it doesn't know that um, you know. What other colors are you know? What other levels are in the image? So it made a mistake. But I just asked for, you know, I just asked for a, a fix, and eventually it will create a new, a new uh, a widget that uh, has the intensity of the scale bar, and now it's fixed. Now I can create scale bars that are, um, you know, you should not. You should also be a little skeptical. It's like a, you know a very very good student. Um, that you can give tasks to, but you need to check what, what the student did, right? Uh, you can't just you know, blindly trust what happens there, right? Um, and machines have inherited our, our imperfection. As, as machines become smarter, they also become more human, and that also means their, their propensity to make mistakes also increases. And mistakes that are becoming you know, also closer and closer to the kind of mistakes we make, which is an interesting thing. Um, yeah, I think, so here is an example uh, of how to make, uh, um, to make a plan for segmenting a 2D image. And so we ask for a plan, and you know, Omega gives a plan, uh, different steps, you know, load the image, you know, apply Gaussian filter. And so, and then I can say, I can say, okay, apply each step of the, you know, Apply each step of the plan uh, on the images that are you know, on the image that's loaded on the parry, and, and it really does the right thing. Um, and uh, you know, there are different steps like erosion, you know, different operations. You you know, the typical things we would do like with classical image processing to make make the segmentation more accurate. Of course, you know, it's you know, I don't think oh, you know, Chaj Omega and by extension, you know, uh, ChatGPT knows about the absolute latest, you know, coolest uh, algorithms for for uh, for image processing or for you know, in this case, you know, by image analysis. Um, but it's also, but it knows a lot actually, uh, and and it knows probably 
enough to teach a lot of people a lot of things about image processing. And you can actually have a dialogue here with the machine and say, look, explain to me what is, you know, what is erosion? And it will actually give you an explanation about this. Um, Omega also has access to lots of different tools. It can also query the web, get download images from the web, uh, search Wikipedia, search Google. I added a lot of tools, which, you know, some of which come with Langchain, others I had to modify and, and improve. But overall, a very powerful platform, which uh, you know, I'm, uh, I really intend to put in the hands of, of everybody in my team as soon as I find time, <laughs> which is a main problem here. Uh, well, voilà. um, that's that's it. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> that is pretty amazing. Thank you so much, Loic. That was impressive. No First, the imaging is absolutely outstanding. And yeah, uh, image analysis software that you can converse with sounds like <laughs> my job is over. <laughs> well, Thank you so I much. Uh, it's an actually interesting thing. Actually, there is actually papers that show that you know LLMs and in general these generative tools have a multiplicative effect. So the benefit of using them is, is a, a compounded with the, the competence of the user. So if the user, so they showed that if the user is not competent, the benefit is all is proportional to that competence. So not, not a competent user, not a competent, uh, not a good output. No, not the, you know, but if the users are very, very competent, if they're experts, then that expertise gets multiplied. Uh, and the results are, are proportionally better. So that's good news. What that means is it's really, these tools have a multiplicative effect on the productivity mm. of their users, not an additive effect. So it's not something which, if it would be additive, it, it would drown the experts, right? Everybody people become an expert. Uh, if, even like it would be additive or even additive plus and saturation where, you know, everybody becomes an expert and then everybody's the same. No, that's not what happens. Experts become even better. And you can uh, your, uh, your abilities. Yes, yes. So you're safe. Um, I really think you're safe. Um, and we're all safe, frank, uh, frankly. Um, I wrote probably half the code of uh, Omega with ChatGPT. I could not have done it as fast as I did it if I had not used ChatGPT to write half the code. Um, <clears throat> there were things I didn't know how to do. And ChatGPT taught me some of these things. And I had, in the end, I still had to understand it. But I could go much faster uh, 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 in, uh, in prototyping it and, 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 and doing it. That's, um, no, that's really exciting. I just had a quick question before we uh, move the questions to the audience. You and I are both not native English speakers. Do you think it's kind of limiting those kind of tools to people who have a really good um, access to English rather, and it's not actually re-democratizing these tools to everyone? It's actually the opposite because in, in the in the preprint I, 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 that I released recently for Omega, um, there's one video which is in French. You can okay. talk to this in French. It just works and it answers back in French. Um, and uh, it just works, and you can and it uh, ChatGPT knows uh, almost any language that you know has enough presence in the textual corpus of the of the internet, and so you probably can you know interact in Chinese or in uh, Spanish, and it just work the same. Oh, that's fantastic! Thanks yeah. for that. Uh, someone has raised their hands. To... Um, there's a Monash BDI guest. Say, oh, okay, sorry. Um, who's raised? Oh, Steve Cody raised their hands. I can try and give you. I've, I've allowed Steve Cody to talk. Ask a oh, question, yeah. please, cool. Steve. Thank you very much. I was intrigued with the uh, zero working distance lens, the oblique lens, <clears throat> and I didn't really understand if you're working on a zebrafish within an agaros plug, how a zero working distance lens yes. actually works for you. Now, is that in the illumination path or the imaging path? So, okay, so, you know, I went a little fast on this part, of course, you know, because yeah. um, I could give a whole talk just on this project, but... Uh, what's happening is that that 
the reason why this this objective can be zero working distance is because it's not in contact with the sample. So the whole idea here is that we we create a virtual image of the sample. So so via remote focusing, we can recreate the the, the sample, the distribution of light of the sample in 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 air essentially. It's as if the sample was there, but it's not really there, right? And then we have an objective that has a zero working distance, and essentially the focal, the focal plane of that objective is on the glass surface. And so, the because the sample is virtual at that location, and not it's not a real sample. It's a, it's a, it's a, the light is relayed in such a way that it as it, it appears as if it was there, but it's not there. Um, that objective, what the objective does in, is that because it has zero working distance, the the light the distribution at, on that plane uh, is entirely captured. All the light rays are captured via refraction of that glass surface. And that's important because we have an oblique detection. So the objectives at an, that, that, that detection plane, that surface of the, the objective is, is at an angle, right? Because that angle is the same angle as the light sheet. And we have to somehow make sure that even though we are at an angle, we still collect all the light that comes from that remote focusing system. Essentially, it's a, that relay, you know, light relaying system, if you wish. Um, and so that's why, uh, it, 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 so we 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 can it it can have a working distance of zero because there's no there's no physical sample there. It's only light distribution, and it has to be a zero working distance because we need to make sure that refraction will bend the light rays and capture all of them. So we actually retain uh, the 1.0 NA resolution um, uh, that corresponds to the, 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 the cone of light that we collect from the, from the sample. Um, yeah, I hope I, you know, I hope I've, I've been fair enough with this. I think I, underst I understood most of that other than then how do you recreate the image? It's essentially, you know, think about, you know, think about a 4F system. If you take a 4F, there are two lenses and you have a sample, one lens, one lens, and then what happens is essentially you have created a virtual image. And one of the standard things in optics is with two lenses, mm -hmm. you can take a, uh, the, the, uh, you can yeah. take a real object like a, like a, uh, like a, a candle. And now you have a virtual image of the candle. And the truth of it is that if, if you, you can look at that, virtual image as if it was a real image uh, the object was really there because uh, the light distribution is as if it was there so there's so you know um, and so that's you know things are a little bit more complicated if you want to do remote focusing and ensure that there's you know perfect you know perfect reproduction of the you, you, you know you, you need to the theory is far more complex but but at some very basic level it you know the theory is not not uh, you know Quite intuitive. Um, it's something that that optics does, you know, very naturally. Yes. Yeah, so you have a another lens that projects the image into a real image. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Gee, you're on mute there. We've got a couple of other questions there in the uh, Q and A. Um, Sorry, <laughs> I was I was talking to myself. I was on mute. Uh, yeah. So Maren has a question about whether the Omega tool will also work on movies, video, uh, for example, in cell segmentation and tracking. Yes, I mean it really doesn't care. Um, no, it's a question of you know do you have enough you know if you can load it in Apari, it, it can run. And of course, if you have you know thousand images instead of one, it's going to take a thousand times longer to do anything on these images. But there's just, you know, like there's a video in the paper, in the preprint where essentially, you know, uh, which is something I really never, I try, I did it. And then when I, you know, I never, I never, never thought it would work, which is I had a URL of a video on, uh, of an MP4. I had a video, uh, the URL of an MP4. I, and I basically wrote something like, okay, this is a MP4, download it open it and track people in the video. It did everything. So it went, it, you know, it wrote code that downloaded the MP4, uh, opened the MP4, 
in the Paris. So, so there was essentially 2D plus time, you know, there was a stack. Um, there are like people working around as a standard, uh, you know, OpenCV video for testing, you know, people tracking. And then uh, it sort of, you know, wrote some OpenCL code to load, you know, to look at each frame, draw some boxes around people for each frame. Um, and then did a little something a little silly, which is to add each frame of the video as a separate layer in the party, which is not the thing you should do, but fine. Uh, but it worked. And then, you know, in the video, you, you zoom in, you know, like you have this kind of mosaic of, of frames, and then you zoom in and, and you can see that on the frames where there's a person, there's a little box around each person. And literally, mm -hmm. like, I had never tried. I tried it. It worked the first time. It doesn't work always. Sometimes, you know, I have to learn a little bit how to say it. Sometimes you don't realize when you're not, not being explicit and clear. But in this case, it was just like this, like literally in one minute, it had finished. And I was like, whoa. Impressive. So we have a question from Kevin. So do you think Nepari will completely replace image J at this point? Or if not, do you think it will happen soon? I, I think, you know, both tools have, you know, uh, a lot of, um, of complementary strengths in many respects. I think, you know, um, there's a lot of people that still, you know, even from for me, sometimes, you know, to really see a pixel, I, I open if I open image A or Fiji because that's what I'm that's what how I learn to look at images. So somehow the ground truth of the image, I still, you know, sometimes open image A if I if I want to be sure what I'm looking at. Uh, but increasingly, of course, I'm using more and more Napari, and Napari is improving, improving. Um, I think fundamentally, uh, you know, when I took the decision I made, you know, in 2017 to switch to Python was really because, you know, deep learning, uh, data science was moving in that direction. I also couldn't hire people that were good enough at writing Java code, right? So I realized that far more people knew how to write Python and also the next generation of people working with images of biologists, but also uh, image analysts, many of them, you know, were gathering, were, were having very strong uh, Python skills actually because the language is easier. And so I think it, and, and the truth is that being in the Bay Area, I realized also that, you know, uh, Python was used by, you know, the wider scientific community, you know, people in astronomy, people in, uh, in uh, material sciences, uh, remote sensing, uh, people from, you know, scientists from many disciplines use Python. Uh, and so, so, so it was clear to me that, you know, where, you know, it was clear to me where things were moving towards. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it will, you know, it doesn't mean that, uh, I think it, it means that just the, the, la the landscape is expanding. I don't think, you know, it's, it, uh, this I don't this think it's it will grow anywhere. Uh, we have another question from Alex Coombs, who says, um, do you, any of the images denoising algorithms in Aiden correct for actual, ex actual issues in Z? No, it's really, so it's really denoising. It's not just improving images, it's denoising. It's just, Aiden is doing one thing and it's doing it to an extreme level of uh, configurability and, and flexibility. And that is image denoising, removing noise from images. It does not, um, it does not like, you know, improve isotropic resolution or these other things. Uh, now it does, can, it can handle n-dimensional images, you know, four-dimensional images without trouble. It can actually do four-dimensional image denoising, which is, I don't think many tools can do that. Um, so really like it can exploit all four dimensions. Um, yeah, but it's really strictly, you know, I don't know if I answer the question, but that's really, really about mm. it. I have a question just for my own interest. Um, how does it perform with EM images? Because they're quite difficult to work with because there's not like a person if it's, there's not a stain, everything is in some sort of shade. So do you, would Aiden work well to try and- I've tried it. Yeah, I've tried it on some FIPSAM images and it looks good. I mean, they're not, I mean, it, it depends, you know, how noisy the images are, right? I mean, it depends like, but uh, I think this, these techniques in general uh, work pretty well on these type of images. And I've tried a few things and I don't have a tutorial on the website on that, but um, yeah, um, overall my experience with it is pretty good. 
And in the end, you have to try. You have to try different yeah. algorithms. And the tutorials actually go through, you know, also the choice, the logic of choices that one makes and how to configure some parameters. Like there's a lot of parameters you can modify, but I think we put a lot of work to educate the user both within the interface, but also with tutorials out uh, on the website. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Is there uh, any more questions? Cool, well, I think we've answered all the questions. Um, so, I mean, it's a virtual webinar, so uh, nobody can join in, but yeah, thank you so much, Loic, for your talk and your time today. It was fantastic and extremely exciting. So I no wish everyone to enjoy the rest of your day and uh, and we'll see you probably in a month for the next uh, seminar. Thank you so much, Loic. Thank you. Bye.